We want to welcome not only all of you here, but we also have people watching on television and online. And I see uh, some of the people on our online audience. We've got Reggie from Arkansas. We've got Jessica from Kentucky. And we've got Danny all the way from Dubai, as well as many others watching online today. Can we give it up for them and everyone else who's watching? We are so thankful uh, that you are making a decision to tune in. If you're watching in the Jackson Metro area on our television broadcast, we are so thankful to have you uh, tune in as well. And hopefully, we'll get a chance to see you all real soon. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles today with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. It's one of my all-time favorite chapters in Scripture. And we want to look at verse number 11 today. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse Number 11. Here the writer records, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Uh, I love it in the NIV translation. It says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time. In fact, it seems painful. You don't believe that? Just ask your teenager. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now, notice here the correlation between discipline and peace. If I've been disciplined with my money, I have peace in my money. Wherever there has been discipline, there's always peace. Now, how many of you like peace? Anybody? How many of you like a little peace and quiet? Have you ever said that? You know what I need? I just need a little peace and quiet around this house. I am an introvert by nature. How many introverts do we have in the room? Uh, uh, you know, some of you are like, I'm not raising my hand. I'm an introvert. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm an introvert for sure. And I recharge in peace. Like I need environments where nothing is moving, uh, where there aren't a bunch of noises. Like I need seclusion just for a minute uh, to recharge my batteries. And I was thinking about this this morning that I had a moment of peace uh, for a morning devotional. I try to wake up before the rest of the household because it is the most peaceful time in the house. Nothing is moving, dogs aren't barking, kids' electronics are not beeping and buzzing. Uh, I don't have Pokemon cards scattered all over the floor. Like, it's just peace, peace. And I so enjoy it. And I was thinking about, like, those are the moments that I kind of connect with wisdom. Those are the moments for me where I connect with God, as in those moments of peace. But the Lord, even this morning, was dealing with my heart about that kind of peace and biblical kind of peace. Like, the biblical kind of peace is not nothing moving The biblical kind of peace is nothing missing. So our type of peace is like, it's just peace and quiet, nothing's moving, nothing is making loud noises. The biblical kind of peace, it may have a measure of that, but it's like the kids who are in the house, they're healthy. The atmosphere in the house, it's healthy. It's filled with love. Everything's working the way it should. When you have the biblical kind of peace, nothing missing, nothing broken, it's like my body is working the way it should be working. My kids' bodies are working the way they should be working. Our kidneys are working the way they should be working. Our finances are working the way they should be working. There is nothing out of harmony. There is nothing out of rhythm. There is peace. Now, I think all of us want that. We want just peace. We want life to work. We want marriage to work. We want family to work. We want this parenting thing to work. We want things working, nothing missing, nothing broken. But it says the pathway to that peace is something called discipline. On the other end of peace, you have its opposite, and it is chaos. Any of you ever experienced chaos in your house? Uh, For me, it happens whenever my daughter wakes up. We have this massive dog who sleeps with my daughter. And when she opens up the door, the dog runs as fast as it can down the wooden steps. And immediately, I know my peace is gone and chaos is about to just intrude upon my peaceful space. Uh, That chaos's name is Sadie. Uh, And it's just going to be everywhere and incredibly loud. And then the kids come down and things just start moving in the house and that peace is gone because the opposite of peace is chaos. And chaos, spiritually speaking, is there's a bunch of stuff missing and broken. Uh, Chaos is when you have children but something in their body is not working and it scares you and there's fear there and it's chaotic because it's not working and there's a bunch of stuff that is missing. 
Chaos is when you lose the job. Before you had the job, bills were paid, everything's great, you have peace, nothing is missing, nothing is broken, but then something breaks and chaos comes in and now all of a sudden you have not just fear, but a lot of times for, especially men, fear manifests as anger. And they're just on edge a lot. And it's not just because they're angry, it's because they're scared. There's something there now that they can't control. There's something there now that's out of the realm of like being able to manifest this. I get this every time we travel as a family. I'm like, oh, you you ask my wife, if there's any time I'm stressed, it's when I'm traveling with my kids and with my wife. Because like, I'm just, I'm I'm a scheduler. I like things going according to plan. And always with kids, there's chaos. And it's like, it's not, and so I get on edge because chaos disrupts me. This is the essence of chaos. Uh, Peace is when there's boundaries and the river works the way it should work and the Pearl River is not running over its banks. Chaos is when it is and what it causes. Now, here's the thing. God came on the scene in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, we see in between verse 1 and verse 2, something happens. In verse 1, we get the idea that there is chaos, there is darkness. It's not good. Nothing is working the way it should be working. And this is not the kind of environment that God wants to bring a family into. So God begins to do something amazing. He begins to bring order to the chaos. He begins to establish rules and boundaries. He begins to bring discipline over into chaos. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Uh, Proverbs kind of sums up what God does in the book of Genesis by saying some of these things. In Proverbs 8 and verse 27, he said, When he prepared the heavens, I was there. Where he set compasses upon the face of the depth, I was there. When he established the clouds above, I was there. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep, I was there. When he gave, notice this, to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment when he appointed the foundations of the earth. When you look at Genesis chapter 1, you see God giving order to nature. Not just order, commandments. He's like, you will not cross this boundary. Ocean, there's sand there, there's land there. You will not cross that boundary. And you may try, but you'll get pushed back. He created boundaries for rivers that they should work in and of those boundaries. You know what it brought, all of this order? You know what it brought? God's order produced something we call Eden. They'll put it up on the screen for those of you who are taking notes. For those of you who are not taking notes, they'll put it up on the screen. God's order produces Eden, a world of perfect peace. Now, when you think of Eden, the Garden of Eden, it was this world where nothing is missing, nothing is broken. It's working the way it should work. It's perfect provision. There's no sickness there. There's no disease there. There's no poverty there. There's no famine there. The ground, when you read the Genesis account, When you read this account, it's like it's perfectly watered. At this time, it had not rained yet. So the ground never got too wet and it never got too dry. Because if it got too wet, that would break order and it would produce chaos. If it got too dry, that would break order and would produce chaos. So God made it work just the way it should work. That mist would come up out of the ground. It would perfectly water Eden so it always stayed beautiful, so that nothing would be missing and nothing would be broken. Beautiful space. And God created this for his people. He created it for you. He created it for me. This is the type of environment that God designed us to live in. And the way he got this environment was by bringing, this is key, the way he got this environment was by bringing order, by bringing discipline, by bringing structure. River, you will not cross your boundaries. Ocean, you will not cross your boundaries. He created boundaries not just for man, but for nature as well. And this order created peace. This order, this discipline created Eden. The lion proverbially proverbially, (laughs) laid down with the lamb. Now, what does that mean? The lion laid down with the lamb. It means that there is no carnage. There is no recklessness. There is no fear. Like, I don't have to be afraid because of all the order. Now, here's what just is mind-blowing when you sit back and look at it. God does something incredibly dangerous. He brings in something we call freedom. He gives man the power to choose. Now, typically, order and freedom don't go together. 
Because when you have order, a lot of times it equals less and less freedom. And when you have freedom, it equals less and less order. But God knows intrinsically, I can't just make my man and make my family do something. I need to give them the power of choice. So he plants a tree in the garden, and he tells man, look, there's all these boundaries, and here's one I'm giving you. Don't eat of this tree. Discipline yourself. Control yourself. But pay attention to this boundary. Because on the other end of this boundary, if you cross it, is chaos. There is death. Whatever you do, don't eat of this tree. My question is, is why in the world would God give man the power to choose? Why wouldn't he just have everything work perfectly with order and structure and no freedom and just allow man to just kind of operate that system, play by those rules, and never give him the choice to break it. Here's what God knows. Order without freedom is prison. Order without freedom is prison. Now, there are a lot of nations in the world today. I'll not name them because, you know, a lot of these nations watch (laughs) our broadcast. Uh, But that focus on order and try to eliminate people's freedom, and without fail, there's always rebellion. In every one of those nations, there is always rebellion. Because when you have order without freedom, it is prison. In prison, here's what time you're going to wake up. Here's what time you're going to go to bed. Here's what you're going to watch, and here's the TV channels you have to watch. Here's how everything is going to function in your life. You're going to eat this, you're going to eat it, and if you don't eat it, then you won't eat. But here's what you're eating. It has order. And whenever we have order without freedom, there is always rebellion. I'll give you examples of this. It's in a lot of our movies. My wife growing up could not watch The Little Mermaid. Uh, And uh, there was reasons for it. And the reason for it was this, is in The Little Mermaid, you see Ariel, the princess, make a decision to disobey her father. And her father has set boundaries that you will not go to land. Because on land, you will get hurt on land. They will abuse you on land. Like, do not go to land. It is dangerous. And, of course, what does Ariel do in the movie? She goes to land. It's like, immediately, as soon as I can, sneak away and cross the boundary. I will cross the boundary. Uh, For instance, Simba and the Lion King. Uh, Somebody says, why are you listing all these cartoons? Because I have kids. It's all the movies I get to watch as cartoons. I don't know the other ones. Uh, and in the, the Lion King movie, you remember the elephant graveyard? It's like, don't go over there, Simba. Don't you go, here's the rules. You have no freedom to go after it. Don't do it. And what does Simba do? He tests those boundaries. He gets as close to it and gets in it and creates chaos. And you see when he breaks those rules and exercises his own personal freedom, there's all this chaos that his father has to deliver him out of. But why is that theme almost in every single movie? I'll tell you why. Because it's in our nature. It's in our nature to want freedom. We don't want someone always lording over us, telling us what to do and how to do it and placing all these restrictions in our lives. Because when you have order without any freedom, it always equals a prison. Here's the other side of this, though. If you have freedom without order, you invite chaos. When you have freedom without order, you invite chaos. I'll give you an example. Uh, In our nation, we are a nation that places an emphasis on freedom. But how many of you know, even in this nation that places an emphasis on freedom, there is still order? I'll give you a for instance. You can't kill me and have there be no consequence. Now, somebody says, well, I'm free to kill whoever I want to kill. Well, yes, you could pick up a gun and you could, like, kill somebody. Uh, And after that, though, order would kick in and bring things into order. Because if you just had freedom wherever people wanted freedom with no checks and balances, with no order, you are inviting chaos. If everybody in this room just could steal and there was no consequence and you could take from your neighbor and there would be no consequence, you could treat, you know, your neighbor however you wanted to treat him and there'd be no consequence and exercise, quote unquote, your personal freedom with no consequence, it would create mass chaos. So we have order in the middle of freedom because we understand like God, we need both. We need order, but we also need freedom. So here's how this works in your life and in mine. 
We live in this dispensation, because of Jesus' great grace, of grace. Because of his mercy, now we live in freedom. That we don't live by the Old Testament law. We are free because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But how many of you know in our freedom, God still has some checks and balances? God still brings in some order. God still brings in some boundaries. And he starts telling us, like single people, he starts telling us, don't have relationships with people before marriage. You know what I'm talking about. Don't do that before marriage. Here's a boundary. Please don't cross it. Why? Because on the other side of the boundary, there's chaos. You may not see the chaos. You think you're smarter than the chaos. But I'm telling you, on the other side of this boundary is chaos. He writes unto people and he tells them financially, here's what I want you to do. I want you to understand the borrower is servant to the lender. And I want you to understand that there's this boundary for debt that my best for you is to owe no man nothing but to love him. So I'm going to ask you to try to get as free as possible from your credit cards. I'm going to ask you to like keep checks and balances financially and make sure I'm not constantly pressing the boundaries of debt. Because on the other side of too much debt is what? Chaos. There is chaos on the other side of debt. He sets in boundaries for parents. He's like, parents, I want you to watch out for something. Here's a boundary for you. I want you not to provoke your children to wrath. That you can get so hard on them and take away so much freedom and be so rough with them that they get resentful of you and they rebel against you anyway. Don't provoke your children to wrath. He comes into children. He's like, here's a boundary for you. Children, I want you to honor your father and mother. And if you do, it will be well with you. It will produce an Eden if your life. And you'll live long on the earth. Boundaries. All of these boundaries. But did you know in the middle of this garden where it's perfect, it's Eden, nothing missing, nothing broken, clear-cut boundary, man has the power to obey it or not, an enemy comes in in that garden, he does something, and the same thing he did to Adam and Eve, I have it so big in my heart today, he's trying to do to some of you. And here's what the enemy did to Adam and Eve. They'll put it up on the screens. The enemies lie. These boundaries were put here to hurt you, to keep you from life. Now, you could word that however you wanted it. It could be these boundaries are old-fashioned. That's not how we operate in the 21st century. These boundaries, well, you know, there's just better and different ways now. And as society advances, we've got a better idea. Well, you know what? We're a free culture, and so let's just everyone do whatever is right on their own eyes, and I don't want anybody telling me what to do. These boundaries, Proverbs put it this way, it said, don't remove the landmarks of your fathers. You know what that means? It means like in the, your father's generation, the generation before me, for instance, there were certain boundaries. And as long as in those boundaries, there's safety, and it's tempting for the next generation to say those boundaries are just too constrictive. So I'll move the boundaries of the generation before me because I want more, here's the key, freedom. And the lie that Satan tells Adam and Eve is this, is if you move this boundary, if you cross it, you know what, you're going to get more freedom. God's trying to keep something from you. God's trying to absolutely just lord over you and trying to steal your personal joy. God is a cosmic killjoy, and he just does not want you to, like, branch out there. But in the day that you eat of it, you're going to have more life and more fun than you've ever had before. And, of course, we know it's a lie. Here was the truth. Why did God put those boundaries there? They were put there to prevent chaos and protect Eden. It was there, that boundary was there, because when a river overruns its banks, overruns its boundary, it always equals chaos. Here's the thing, God's heart for you and for me has always been to bring us back to Eden, to bring us back to a place where in your life and in mine, there is nothing missing, there is nothing broken. That in your life and mine, we have this like amazing peace where life is good, and not just good, where it is working. And the way that we get that type of Eden is by bringing our life more under the control of those boundaries and disciplines, knowing that God is a God of freedom. 
But there are certain things in our life that he asks us to just keep firm as boundaries. Right after Adam and Eve sinned, God introduced, I never saw this before. I never quite made this parallel until this week. But right after Adam and Eve sinned and caused chaos for them, right, they cross the boundary and what happens? It's chaos. I mean, and we're still suffering the ramifications of their decision to cross that boundary. And now we have rivers that cross their boundaries and bring chaos and flood because the world is under the curse that Adam and Eve brought to the world because they crossed that boundary. And here we're at this place where God is coming to them, and right after they sin, he, he introduces something that up to that time had never been in the world before. Never saw that until this week. Something called sacrifice. Right after Adam and Eve sin, God introduces a system whereby you can get Eden back in your life. That if you follow this principle enough, you can bring Eden back into your life, where nothing is missing and nothing is broken. And somebody says, well, what is it's sacrifice? What is sacrifice? To bring order to your present so that your future can be free from chaos. What, what, what does sacrifice mean? To bring order to my present so that my future can be free from chaos. I'll use the financial example again. There is a way right now that if I conduct my finances with discipline and sacrifice order and rules, that I avoid debt that I avoid things in life that just take up too much of my finances that don't produce any rate of return whatsoever and make wise, intelligent choices to avoid debt, to live beneath my means and all of these boundaries that no one likes to live by. But if I can, in the short term, live by those boundaries now, in the long term, I can have Eden. I can have a place where I'm debt free. I can have a place where I'm free to run. I can have a place where we can vacation there and we can do that for the kids and we can do this here because that sacrifice brought order to my present so that my future could be everything God wanted it to be. Let me talk to the single people here this morning. God would ask you once again to conduct yourself in a way that treats younger women as sisters and older women as mothers. And you're in this place where God is like calling you to holiness and God is calling you to like save yourself for marriage or whatever you want to call it. And here we have a culture that throws out the complete opposite of that and tells you you can cross that boundary at any time you want and anyone who tells you you can't, you know what they are, they're old fashioned. They're just old fashioned. And they don't understand the 21st century, so you just keep swiping right. <laughs> and God is like, but I know something you don't know. Because I made you. I made your body. I made your soul. made your spirit. And here's what I know. It's like the old 90s song. The first cut will be the deepest. <laughs> now, think about that line. Think about that line. The first cut will be the deepest. You won't forget that one. And my best for you would be to have that with one, that two shall become one, that my plan for you is one, that you have intimacy with someone, that the two of you share with each other what only the two of you share. And that if you could have that, it doesn't make you old-fashioned. It actually places you over into Eden, where there is a peace and a joy that comes into your marriage and comes into your family that is absolutely my best for you. And God has these systems set up in our world that absolutely, when followed and kept and focused on, do not restrict our freedoms, but instead produces more freedom and more joy and more peace than you could ever possibly imagine. So here's what I want for you today. This phrase has just been in my heart the whole week. Here's what I want for you today. I want you to consider your path. Every single person in this room, you're headed somewhere financially. Can I ask you, is that where you want to end up? 
Some of you today, like relationally, it's just, woo, it's been wild and it's been out of control. And here's what I would ask. You're on a path. Is that where you want to end up? What about your health? What about if you keep going in the direction that you're going in with your health? Where does that path take you? Where is that path going to lead you? Consider your path. Here's a question for you. What's in your life that's gotten out of order? Is there something in your life that's just gotten out of control here recently? It's gotten out of order. Here's here's another question. What area of your life are you pushing boundaries in? It's like, I know these are boundaries, but I'm just testing and pushing against that boundary. Here's another question. All of these are kind of the same question, just phrased a different way. Are you moving landmarks that God has established? Like God has placed in borders, and it's like, I don't think we'll just move these. Are you violating your heart? Is there area in, in your life where maybe you are lowering your standard? Samson was this guy, in the, I'll close with this, this guy in the Old Testament who is just amazing, uber talented, right? Like you couldn't get more anointed in this kind of peculiar anointing than Samson, like amazing. The world had never seen anyone like him. And he comes onto the earth and God begins to give him boundaries in which to live by. Like, and some of the boundaries seem kind of silly, like don't cut your hair. Another one was, don't touch dead things. And at the end of Samson's life, because Samson is living in this world where in the book of Judges, it ends the book of Judges with this sentence. It's scary because it reminds me of some of the world we're living in right now. It ends with this sentence, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And Samson is a part of this world And he's just constantly doing what's right in his own eyes, what he wants to do, exercising his personal freedom and not living in control. And here at the end of his life, you see all of this chaos just come. And it's not because Samson was like the odd case. You see it happen in Peter's life. You see it happen in Judas's life. You see it happen in Adam and Eve's life. You see Abraham cross the boundary and lay with Hagar and the chaos that comes out of that with Ishmael. Like you see Jonah violate his heart and start heading away from Nineveh and the chaos that comes in Jonah's story. Like in all of these stories, you see people knowing a clear-cut boundary violating that boundary, and on the other end of violating is like all of this chaos that just hits their world. And you see this moment in Samson's story where he like knows he shouldn't be with this prostitute. Like he knows this is not a good idea, but day after day he finds his head in her lap. Like you would think, After you tell her the secret to your strength for the upteenth time, and she does the very thing you told her was the secret of your strength, that you would get the idea that this is probably a relationship you need to get out of. And we laugh at Samson, but some of us have all of these warning signs as well that I probably need to make this adjustment in my health, and I probably need to make this adjustment in my finances, and I probably need to make this adjustment in my relationships, and I probably need to make this adjustment with how I'm, I'm treating myself and like all of these signs. But here's my point, is Samson in his story, we see this moment where one day he's walking, and this is long before the lady he shouldn't be with, he's walking, and he sees a lion that he has killed. And the lion has decomposed, and the skeleton is there, and in the middle of the lion's mouth, there is honey, something sweet and something dead. Something sweet, but it's in the mouth of a lion. And Samson's walking by, and honey in those days was like a delicacy. It's like, whoo, if you could have anything, you'd want some honey. And he sees it, and he's looking at it, and here's the thought process going on in Samson's life. He's like, I know it's dead, but there's honey in it. And I, I, I know God has given me this boundary to not touch the dead things, but... There's something sweet in it. So this is the way his mind works. 
what if I could get the honey without touching the dead? What if I could like kind of get up close to the boundary but not cross it? And I'll just maneuver my hand just enough to kind of take of the honey, but when I take of the honey, I'm not actually touching anything that's dead. And he reaches in, he grabs it, he tastes it, and it's so sweet. But it's letting us in into a picture of his psychology of long before Delilah, this is the way he's living. Of here's a boundary, let me just keep pushing it and pushing it, and pushing it, and pushing it, and pushing it, and pushing it. Until finally, this lack of order invites incredible chaos into his life. Esau, one bowl of soup, invites chaos into his life. And in your own life, are you inviting chaos? Is there an area of your life that you, you just know, like, the Bible has told me to give no place to the devil because he is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And it's like in my life right now, I really am giving place to him through this. And I just felt really compelled by God to, like, ask you that. I had a whole other message plan. I was going to talk just to singles today. I had baggage I was going to bring out and talk about how in marriage you either come in with a hope chest or baggage and like had all of these examples. I was going to pull out, throw a frisbee in the crowd, be fun. And I kid you not, I text the team and I'm like, I know y'all did so much work on that baggage. Labeling all those shirts and pants. And... But I'm like, I can't shake this. I really feel like that there's somebody You've been testing a boundary that nobody knows. And you're pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And God so desperately is trying to get your attention because he knows you are inviting chaos into your family, into your life, into your finances, maybe into your health, maybe into your marriage, maybe into your ministry. And I just want to ask you, and hopefully the Spirit of God is like behind this ask, I just want to ask you to consider your ways to pull back and to believe that discipline brings peace. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you in all of our hearts and our lives today that you just help us fully surrender to you. And Father, I know the issue of just being human, of being filled with desires that are not healthy desires, of being drawn away and enticed with desires. I know even in my own life there are boundaries that I have pushed and even boundaries that I have crossed that all of us in this room can relate to those things. But Father, what I ask by the power of your Holy Spirit is that each individual in this room would love themselves enough to make any change that they need to make. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Do you love yourself enough to make the change? Love your family enough to make the change. Love your future enough to make the change. Love your Lord enough to make the change. Father, I just thank you that you give them the overwhelming grace to do it. We love you, Father, so very much. And we ask it all, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this YouTube channel. I want to encourage you to subscribe to the link if you haven't already for more weekly content that I'm sure is going to be a blessing to you as well. Click the link below if you would like to partner with us to help us get this message out to even more people. Thank you so much for your generosity. We'll see you next week.